A quick warning, this video can cause feelings of existential dread and panic, eco-anxiety. Make sure that you're in a good space before you watch this video. Every single one of the problems that this video brings up has solutions, and we can fix this. But we can't fix it unless we understand what they are. And we can't fix this unless society at large understands how bad things are. So this is your red pill, blue pill moment. If you want to take the blue pill, you don't feel good about watching this video, and there's nothing wrong with that, then check out this video up here. This is just me enjoying the food forest, acting like a kindergarten kid watching rabbits. But if you're ready to change the world, then take the red pill. Come with me, watch my video intro, and let's figure out what we're going to do about this. Mission, among other things, changed 
the environmental movement, really launched the modern environmental movement 18 months after this Earthrise picture was first seen on Earth. The first Earth Day was organized, and we learned a lot about ourselves looking back at our planet from space. And one of the things that we learned confirmed what the scientists have long told us. One of the most essential facts about the climate crisis has to do with the sky, as this picture illustrates. The sky is not the vast and limitless expanse it appears when we look up from the ground. It is a very thin shell of atmosphere surrounding the planet. That right now is the open sewer for our industrial civilization as it's currently organized. We are spewing 110 million tons of heat-trapping global warming pollution into it every 24 hours. Free of charge, go ahead. We still rely on dirty carbon-based fuels for 85 percent of all the energy that our world burns every year. And you can see from this image that after World War II, the emission rates started really accelerating. And the accumulated amount of man-made global warming pollution that is up in the atmosphere now traps as much extra heat energy as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours, 365 days a year. Fact-checked over and over again, conservative, it's the truth. Now, it's a big planet, but that is a lot of energy, particularly when you multiply it 400,000 times per day. And all that extra heat energy is heating up the atmosphere, the whole Earth system. Let's look at the atmosphere. This is a depiction of what we used to think of as the normal distribution of temperatures, but the entire curve has moved to the right in the 1980s, and you'll see in the lower right-hand corner the appearance of statistically significant numbers of extremely hot days. In the 90s, the curve shifted further, and in the last 10 years, you see the extremely hot days are now more numerous than the cooler than average days. In fact, they are 150 times more common on the surface of the Earth than they were just 30 years ago. Commander Kelly, what a thrill it is to be speaking to you. Uh, as you travel at a rate of uh, five miles per second, I understand 200 miles above us, uh, getting close to finishing a year in space. Everyone is fascinated with, this, with space, and everyone is certainly fascinated with the views that you have. You get to look back on Earth. If Earth were a human body and you were looking at it, how does it look? Does, does Earth look sick? Does it look healthy? How would you describe it? So there are definitely parts of um, you know, Asia, Central America, um, that when you look at them from space, you're, uh, you know, you're always looking through a, a haze of, uh, of pollution. As far as the atmosphere is concerned, and, and you know, being able to see the surface, um, you know, I'd say definitely those areas that I mentioned look you know, kind of sick, uh, like you said. Um, you definitely notice weather systems at times that aren't really expected to, to be you know, where they are. You know, the atmosphere, uh, I wouldn't say it looks, you know, the, the thin veil of the atmosphere on the limb of the earth, I wouldn't say it looks unhealthy, but it definitely looks uh, very, very fragile and uh, you know, just kind of like this thin film. So uh, it, it looks like something that we definitely need to take care of. In Canada, we are losing nature faster than we can recover it. Thousands of plants and animals are at risk of extinction in Canada. The concerning data coming from a recent report shows the number of species at risk continues to increase and thousands are at risk of completely disappearing from the wild. 
Released every five years, the 2020 Wild Species Report shows the number of plants, animals, fungi, and other organisms at risk. The number of species at risk of extinction has increased steadily since the first report was published two decades ago. Extinction is a very chilling word. Once something is gone, it is gone forever. Addressing the report, Terry Duguid says the clock is ticking and efforts need to be doubled to ensure the conservation of all species. One in five species are at risk of extinction in Canada. Sandra Schwartz with the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society says the report reveals shocking truths. This report is like an orchestra of canaries in the coal mines and they're down in the bottom of the coal mines, they're in the shafts, they're up you know, on the surface and they're all singing extremely loudly and they're telling us we are on a dangerous, um, dangerous path. Nature Conservancy of Canada's Aaron Jacob says now is the time to act to reverse the troubling trends seen in the report. She says solutions have to be put into practice before it's too late and hopes the report will help drive decision making at the UN Biodiversity Conference taking place in Montreal on December 7th. A global biodiversity summit put together by the United Nations got off to a bumpy start in Montreal on Tuesday. Organizers are blaming delegates for failing to make ends meet or is one of the most important gathering of biodiversity in a decade. UN summit opening this week in Montreal is aimed at protecting worldwide ecosystems and averting potential mass extinctions of global wildlife. Negotiators from nearly every nation and thousands of organizations hope that the two-week summit, known as COP15, yields a deal that ensures there is more nature animals, plants, and healthy ecosystems in 2030 than what exists now. A key element, a key goal of COP15 is for the nations of the world to agree to protect more of the land and more of the ocean. Stuart Pym is the Doris Duke Professor of Conservation at Duke University. COP15 is important because the biggest irreversible change to our planet is that we are driving species to extinction uh, a thousand times faster than they should be going extinct. Unlike uh, climate change, which is bad enough, you know, if you lose species, you can never get them back. According to a 2022 UN Global Land Outlook Assessment, more than one million species are now threatened with extinction, vanishing at a rate not seen in 10 million years. As much as 40% of Earth's land surfaces are considered degraded. Susan Lieberman is the Vice President for International Policy for the Wildlife Conservation Society. What I don't want is in 10 years to say, well, that one failed, let's try again. We can't afford that. Humanity can't afford that, and nature can't afford that. Every, a lot of ecosystems are at the tipping point. Any more destruction, and they can never recover. Preparing for a confrontation. I think they thought we were just going to go away. Anti-logging activists are vowing to make it as difficult as possible for the RCMP to move in and open up these roads, which lead to one of the few remaining stands of old growth forest in the area. Shauna Knight has been here almost full time since August. So that's why we're here, is to pause the saw. Everyone she expects to police to arrive any things. day. Ultimately, if I'm faced with that, yeah, I'll be arrested. For decades, the industry has argued trees like this are incredibly valuable, but as lumber. The industry says these trees are vital to its economic survival. We do not welcome or support unsolicited involvement or interference by others in our territory. Our political elite have been duped. You don't cut down the forest, honey. You leave it up and you go there and pray and meditate. The Sierra Club of Canada says original old growth forests on Vancouver Island have gone from this to less than 10% of what was there before logging started. This area is near where Teal Jones wants to log in Ferry Creek. Bill Jones' niece, Katie George Jim, is one of those waiting for the police to move in. It is my responsibility to the law of the land to be here or to be in, in defense of um, territories under threat. They can't arrest us all. This woman has buried her hands in the ground beneath this logging road, encased in concrete. I tied myself into this tube in the ground and 
So I'm kind of stuck here until they get me out, basically. <laughs> Her goal is to stop loggers from getting access to old growth trees. This is so important. This is crucial. This is not replaceable. RCMP personnel are tasked with removing the protesters. Here is a structure that um, some of the protesters have made. It's a, an enormous log that they've um, obviously salvaged from around here. What we can see here is that they have put inside there a piece of metal. And then around that, they've put concrete. And then she's either holding on to chain or she's actually chained. It's a shame that it has to come to this. I don't want to be strapped to a log, but it's, it's really hard that we have to be doing this. The variety of obstacles spread out over multiple locations makes it a slow process to remove them. On a quick look, it can seem like we're a bunch of dirty hippies, you know, just kicking it out in the woods, trying to, trying to prevent people from doing their jobs. But it's so much, it's so much more than that. They drop someone in the tree, he's in the tree above me. This protester spent eight nights on a platform 60 meters up an old growth cedar tree in the path of the logging. The entire set was shaking, all the tarps were coming apart. RCMP officers descended from a helicopter and arrested her. I think the only like truly fearful point I had was when that helicopter was right above my sit. It was really not at a safe distance. I did not know what was going to happen in that moment. Released from custody, she's pledged to keep up the fight. Until old growth logging stops, until we start to have more respect for the land and respect for the people of the land, this isn't going to go anywhere. Old growth logging opponents say hundreds more are willing to be arrested. So in the end, what you have is a very determined group of people up against a police force intent on enforcing this injunction. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, near Port Renfrew, BC. Forests precede civilizations, and deserts follow them. All of our exalted technological progress, civilization for that matter, is comparable to an axe in the hand of a pathological criminal. Civilization is a hopeless race to discover remedies for the evils it produces. The end of the human race will be that it will eventually die of civilization. The earth is littered with the ruins of empires and civilizations that once believed they were eternal. Now, these are powerful quotes. A couple of years ago, the BBC uh, did a deep civilization series. There was an article written by Luke Kemp. Are we on the road to civilizational collapse? And of course, he answered yes. And then he had this chart that showed 88 ancient civilizations, between just the ones between 3000 BCE and 1000 of the common era. Turns out if you go back before 3000 BCE, or if you look at the last thousand years, it's well over 100. But he just cataloged these here during that 4000 year period. And what we've discovered is that collapse is a feature, not a bug. It's a feature of human centered, that is anthropocentric civilizations. It's not a feature of life-centered, ecocentric cultures that are more or less sustainable, but it's absolutely a central feature of civilizations. Arnold Toynbee, one of the most important and well-known historians of the 20th century, said great civilizations are not murdered. They take their own lives.
as long as conditions are fantastic, they will continue to grow at exponential growth rate. But then once, once those environmental pressures start to appear, once we have competition for resources, that's when we see the population hit its carrying capacity. So initially you'll see overshoot and then you'll see die back. But then you're going to, for a while, kind of see the same thing happen because as it falls below carrying capacity, resources are good again. So there's an abundance of resources and so you'll see them overshoot again. When you have overshoot, you have a tremendous use of resources and so that might degrade the resources available uh, in the future. And so then you can see the population that it can be sustained actually decrease over time. And so there's a lot of, a lot of math involved that we're not going to get into, but you just have to know the basic concept of this. Now, speaking of societal or civilizational collapse, it's when a gradual downward trend goes into unstoppable decline, out of control, irreversible. And it turns out that collapse is a process. It's not an event. Here's the example of industrial civilization or what William Catton called Homo Colossus, last 270 years. The stability of the biosphere has been in decline for centuries and in unstoppable, out of control, runaway mode for two to seven decades. And seven decades ago is 1950. And that's usually where, where you see all these charts. It usually sort of goes hockey stick at 1950. So every single thing we depend upon, there's nothing that humans depend upon or other mammals for that matter, but let's just stay with humans. There's nothing we depend upon that isn't just in decline, but is in precipitous freefall. Here, there's even a book by Robert Colville called The Great Acceleration, how the world is getting faster, faster. And these, again, measures of the Anthropocene, that is, measures of the last uh, 270 years. So here are the sources. You can uh, check out New Scientist and Global Change and Earth System. As I mentioned before, on the left, you've got socioeconomic trends, but really, this is the cause of biosphere collapse. And on the right, it says Earth system trends, but it's our only life support system. So calling these things what they are, ecocidal trends and ecosystem collapse. And so in order to have this look the way it really is, I've turned it on its head. So here we got have Gaia's health has been in decline for centuries and in runaway, unstoppable collapse for two to seven decades. And this becomes obvious, it goes hockey stick around 1950. For example, the Holocene stability. What allowed for civilizations and the growing of grain at scale was a stability in the climate that we've already lost. Ice, we've lost basically the ice of the world, the Arctic sea ice, Antarctica, Greenland, mountain glaciers, obviously not overnight, not even in decades. Just this, just ice, the loss of ice um, is an extinction level, a potentially extinction level collapse. The oceans, the plankton, corals, the coral reefs, fish, ocean acidification, oceanic dead zones, uh, the oxygen crisis, 
and sea level rise. We're looking at at least 40 feet of sea level rise, no matter what, even if everybody went extinct tonight. The former president of the Jacques Cousteau Society, John Englander, says that we can expect at least 40 feet of, of uh, increase. Uh, it's already unstoppable. Soil, the amount of soil, fertility of the soil, the moisture of the soil, permafrost, all this methane from the permafrost. And then the mass extinction. Only once in Earth's history have we lost the insects and the forests. And we're now expanding. We're now exuding more carbon dioxide at a faster rate, that is, than at that extinction. I'm going to ask you one final question before I let you go. And again, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Sure. I want to end on a big picture note because um, I feel like on a subject like this, it's really important to remember the bigger picture. I assume you're familiar with the great filter theory in the context of Fermi's paradox. Uh, I am indeed, yes. So just for the benefit of our audience, for anyone who is not aware of the great filter, and I really encourage you to Google it, go check it out. There is some amazing um, stuff written about this. The Great Filter is one of the possible explanations for Fermi's paradox, which says since we know the universe should be teeming with life, then why haven't we encountered any? And the Great Filter hypothesis suggests that there is something, we don't know what, but something that prevents civilizations from surviving past a certain level of technological development, which means they end up destroying themselves before they ever have the chance to communicate with any other intelligent civilization, such as ourselves. So given where we find ourselves, do you think climate change is the great filter? Have you thought of climate change in those terms? I have indeed. Um, and climate change and environmental degradation in, in general, um, because of course climate change is just one axis in this multi-dimensional space, which is environmental sustainability. And we are of course uh, challenging the ability of this planet to you know, meet our basic uh, resource needs uh, right now. Um, there's no question about it. Uh, now, will that, you know, lead to our ultimate demise or even extinction? Uh, you know, who, who knows? Uh, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball that I can look into and, and tell you what will happen in the future. Mbrame <laughs>
One of the hardest questions to answer is, what does collapse look like? And it's because the answer is, it depends. Collapse has the potential to be immediately and swift. And that'll happen if we just continue going on with business as usual. But if humanity takes swift action and invests into transforming human society, then we might avoid collapse. And in between those two things, there's a spectrum of how this plays out. But over the last 200 years, only one thing is abundantly clear, that if humanity is going to take collective action and sacrifice in the short term for the future, the humanity is going to have to feel pain first. The only question is how much. I don't personally believe humanity is going to continue ignoring the problems that we have. And for that reason, I don't personally believe that we're going to have abrupt systemic collapse. I think collapse is going to follow the boiling frog analogy. Two frogs are minding their own business in the swamp when, wham, they're kidnapped. They come to in a kitchen, captives of a menacing chef. He boils up a pot of water and lobs one of the frogs in, but it's having none of this. The second its toes hit the scalding water, it jumps right out the window. The chef refills the pot, but this time he doesn't turn on the heat. He plops the second frog in, and this frog's okay with that. The chef turns the heat on very low, and the temperature of the water slowly rises, so slowly that the frog doesn't notice. In fact, it basks in the balmy water. Only when the surface begins to bubble does the frog realize it's toast. What's funny about this parable is that it's not scientifically true for frogs. In reality, a frog will detect slowly heating water and leap to safety. Humans, on the other hand, are a different story. We're perfectly happy to sit in the pot and slowly turn up the heat, all the while insisting it isn't our hand on the dial, arguing about whether we can trust thermometers and questioning, even if they're right, does it matter? It does. Since 1850, global average temperatures have risen by one degree Celsius. That may not sound like a lot, but it is. Why? One degree is an average. Many places have already gotten much warmer than that. Some places in the Arctic have already warmed four degrees. If global average temperatures increase one more degree, the coldest nights in the Arctic might get 10 degrees warmer. The warmest days in Mumbai might get five degrees hotter. If we keep emitting greenhouse gases at our current pace, scientists predict temperatures will rise four degrees from their pre-industrial levels by 2100. Jumping out of the proverbial pot isn't an option, but we can do something the frogs can't. Reach over and turn down the heat. When the change happens fairly slowly, longer than a single human generation, we get people being acclimated to what their fundamental reality is. Since the dawn of human civilization, Earth has lost roughly 90% of its biodiversity. Many of our farming communities have lost over 98% of their topsoil. But to us, having two or three inches of topsoil is pretty good. When I was a kid, you could drive to the cottage and your car would be covered in insects. But today, you drive to the cottage and you barely even see anything. Some of the losses we see are recoverable. We can regrow forests even though it gets harder and harder. We can regrow our topsoil even though that becomes difficult. But some of the things that we face in the future have a lot of momentum with them. It's very hard to refreeze the ice caps. We can use trees and carbon capture technology to pull CO2 out of the air. It's a lot harder to pull out methane and nitrous oxide. It's almost impossible to restore our oceans. Coral bleaching is destroying coral. It's easier to preserve these things than it is to rebuild them. And it's impossible to replace extinct species. The way that human society is set up, the consequence for most of the choices we make aren't inherently visible to us. Expanding and sprawling suburbia cuts down forests and grasslands.
buying hamburgers actually cuts down the rainforest. Simply getting to work pollutes our air. And simply existing and living in the world today causes massive amounts of garbage and landfills. We live in a world where simply doing your laundry puts microplastics into the environment, both from fabric softener sheets and also just from damage to the clothing that we wear. And for many of us, simply choosing to eat, choosing to survive, causes ecosystem collapse and extinctions. There's a statistic that a hundred of the worst emitters cause 71% of the world's pollution. The problem with that statistic is that it ignores the fact that they're just supplying into our demand. But at the same time, we need to realize that people can't make individual choices to solve the problem when there's systemic reasons why they have to make those choices. We can't reduce our carbon footprint if companies require office workers to drive an hour into an office building instead of working from home. And how can people reduce transportation costs when cities are designed towards cars, roads, and urban sprawl? So not only do we need to redesign our political systems, we also need to redesign our cities and how we live. Because the solutions to the transportation problem aren't more electric cars and more roads. The solution is mass transit and effective city design. And the solution is that our workforce needs to work from home if it's at all possible. The biggest difference is that while other cities put bicycle trails where they're easy to build, such as along a former rail line or through a park, these bicycle roads are part of a wider network and are explicitly built to connect to destinations you'd actually want to go to, such as a sports arena, a park, a school, a swimming pool, or a hospital. So I find myself using them regularly because they're the fastest and most convenient way to get to where I need to be. I never realized how much of my time cycling was spent worrying about cars. Even if you're in a protected bicycle lane, there are still side streets, driveways, parked vans and junctions. But on a bicycle road, you can quickly and easily get from point A to point B and never cross paths with a car. When a bicycle road meets up with a car road, the cars will often go in an overpass, allowing people to cycle underneath without ever worrying about motor vehicles at all. This is all part of the Dutch approach to separating routes taken by cars from those taken by bicycles. For example, at Amsterdam Zoud, the third busiest station, there are one, two, three underground parking garages. And this last one, opened in 2018, is absolutely stunning. So when you see parking like that, you can understand why this janky metal structure needed to be replaced, and thankfully, it has been. With two beautiful new bicycle parking garages. The first and most impressive opened up just a few days ago, an underground bicycle parking garage in front of the station. What is accounted for is Ove Fiets, the public bicycles that can be rented by the day from most train stations in the Netherlands. Eventually, this whole open area will be full of rental bikes. These are fantastic. So while we can make individual choices to help, we need systemic and radical change in all facets of human society. A 10% world. And what if a 10% world becomes a 1% world in another few hundred years? And we continue to survive on a concrete world, substituting for all that's lost with technological substitutes, making oxygen maybe with vats of algae, drawing down the carbon to maintain atmospheric equilibrium with machines, uh, enclosing our cities in, in bubbles. I mean, we're already kind of doing that. Everybody's house is climate controlled and getting air filters and water filters. Like what if we could survive in a totally poisoned world if we have the right filters, if we have the hydroponic factories to make the food or vat grown meat? What if we could do that? What's going to stop us? This is a more important question because in fact, we have been walking down that path for a very long time. What's going to stop us from taking another step and another step and another step down that path? Now, I'm not saying that we could do that, that we could become independent of the ecology. But so far, we've been doing a pretty good job of it. Population, longevity, GDP, literacy, all of these things have stayed steady or increased, even as 
life has declined. So our experience up until now says maybe we could do it. So the question is, do we want to? And maybe we need to replace the rhetoric of we better change or we're not going to survive. Because what if that's not true? And what if people sense that that's not true? And they don't really believe it. I mean, you can read all the science you want. You can read about the methane feedback loop all you want. But do you really believe that we're going to be extinct in 20 years? So the important question then is not what do we need to do to survive? I think the question we need to be asking, not how will we survive, but what world do we want to live in? The current definitions of wealth revolve around money, income, GDP, profits, but these are manufactured definitions of wealth. Ancient civilizations defined wealth by their natural systems. It's how many fish were in the river and lakes, how many animals could they hunt, how many trees provided food, what was the quality of their water and their air. These very same things were often aligned with what they defined as their currency. Most value for value exchanges were done in bartering, trading food for clothing. Our current definitions of wealth, when we focus on running society to optimize it, we actually trade the real wealth, the natural wealth, for creating things to make profits. We're selling our future for today. Another problem with how we actually hold and store wealth is that wealth now can be hoarded. In the past, if you extracted a hundred fish out of a lake, not only was it silly in terms of stealing wealth from the future, but the wealth that you extracted couldn't be hoarded. Harvesting excess food or lumber just caused those commodities to rot. When humans moved from these natural commodities to items like coins and gold, we still couldn't really hoard that much wealth. You needed somewhere to store it, you needed security to hold it. The advent of modern currency, and especially the digitization of that currency, means that you can indefinitely hold and hoard immense amounts of wealth. So when human society moved to these forms of wealth storage, we were actually able to transfer massive amounts of wealth from one generation to another. Most of this wealth was actually gained through the extraction of labor of the poor. It was acquired through slavery. Even in modern day times, wealth is largely accrued off of the extraction of labor of the workforce. There's no reason a CEO needs to make 360 times what their average worker makes. The justification for why that's okay is because they own the means of production. They own the land, they own the machines that produce the things. But for a majority of these people, they're only in that situation because of the inheritance that they receive from their families. When this inheritance is tracked through the historical family line, you find that this wealth that was used to acquire the means of production was actually stolen off of the labor of generations worth of the exploited. So over the past 2000 years, humans have both created systems that exploited the labor of the poor through slavery, acquire this fake wealth by sacrificing the true natural world wealth managed to store and hold that wealth over generations and hand it down and use that hoarded fake wealth to secure the means of production through which the extraction of labor happens today to drive profits to very few people. So here's another uh, visual of this out of control climate. 50 years, 33 climate conferences, and half a dozen major international agreements have not reduced atmospheric carbon concentrations one bit.
And in fact, it's been going up exponentially as this chart shows. So here we've got all the various agreements and, and uh, you know, cop this and cop that and these agreements and these pledges and all that. And it turns out that it's been going exponential. Our summits, our agreements, our promises and pledges are worse than meaningless. So here we see in the 1960s, it was just under one part per million per year. Okay. In the 1970s, it was 1 1.3 parts per million per year, carbon dioxide. In the 80s and 90s, 1.5, 2000s, 2.0. Uh, the last three years, actually the last two years, uh, it's been a, a, nearly 2.5, 2.4, in the 2010s, and, and now it's, it's uh, above 2.5. So it's rising exponentially, whatever our agreements may be. This slide is the most sobering one I'm sharing in this program. This is ongoing collapse and possible near-term extinction level tipping points that are already in the rearview mirror. The media and governments will talk about these as we're at risk of crossing these tipping points. You know, we, we need to be careful to not do this. And all this language that imagines wrongly that these tipping points are in the future, potentially. No, these are already in the rearview mirror. These are already, we've already passed these in some cases by a decade or two or three. These are self-reinforcing and cascading. That is the impact with each other, feedback loops that are now in unstoppable out of control, runaway mode. I mentioned before the loss of the world's ice, the Arctic, Greenland, West Antarctica, eventually East Antarctica as well, the mountain glaciers, just this itself, just this is enough to potentially cause our extinction as a species and most mammals. Dar Jamel's The End of Ice is one of the best books. In fact, I tell people, if you only read one book on climate change, make it Dar Jamel's The End of Ice. Peter Wadhams, one of the most famous and well-known and respected scientists in the world related to the Arctic and, and ice, a farewell to ice. When most of the Arctic ice is gone, the serious global warming begins and learn about phase change and latent heat. You can Google that. Methane hemorrhaging, methane belching, methane from the permafrost or what used to be permanently frosted, Methane hydrates, methane clathrates, oil and gas wells, millions of oil and gas wells are leaking methane, wetlands. It turns out this is also, uh, even if somehow, you know, there's all this emphasis on, on uh, reducing emissions. If, if human beings could somehow miraculously stop emissions, carbon dioxide emissions tomorrow, obviously we can't, but if we could, methane and carbon dioxide will continue to rise because of some of these things right now that are already in in out of control mode. For example, the oceans, the acidification of the oceans, the deoxygenation of the oceans. And as I said before, 25 to 40 feet of abrupt nonlinear sea level rise. That's what's already baked in, 25 to 40 feet of abrupt nonlinear sea level rise. The great conflagration of the world's forests. Virtually every year, there may be a one year or so that's temporarily not as bad as the previous year. But as a general rule, every year, there's going to be bigger forest fires, more intense and hot forest fires, creating their own weather in some cases, which is out of control greenhouse gas emissions. Even if we could somehow control all humans, just the burning of the forests and the loss. It turns out that the boreal forests in Canada and Russia, these are no longer carbon sinks, they're carbon sources, they're now sourcing, even the Amazon is now giving more carbon dioxide and methane and nitrous oxide than it's absorbing. This is a huge transformation. The collapse of supply chains, this is the only one here that's not sort of a, a living world, but the collapse of supply chains, food, water, energy, essentials, and escalating conflicts from that increasingly severe and deadly weather. Storms, floods, droughts, hailstorms, hurricanes, you name it. Leading to the mass extinction of many plant and animal species, probably the, probably the vast majority. And that's also likely to include us. We know for a fact that Homo colossus, industrial humans, is destined for extinction. That may or may not include the extinction of Homo sapiens, but it certainly could. And we can't rule that out as a possibility, even in the next just few decades. 
Humans are living inside overshoot. And every single day that passes where we live inside overshoot, we cause often permanent damage to the carrying capacity of the earth. There's not just one overshoot curve. There's overshoots in every single aspect of humanity and human civilization. Our fossil fuel use is causing overshoot for carbon in the air. The carbon in the air is causing overshoot and collapse of the oceans through ocean acidification, which causes damage to all living things in the ocean, especially coral reefs and phytoplankton. Overshoot in natural resource extraction, agriculture, and clearing of forests for human use. Human land use now exceeds 50% of the world's land use. The natural world is running out of habitat. Human agriculture use, which accounts for most of humanity's land use, sprays toxic chemicals to reduce competition for growing plants and also remove insect pests. This is causing collapse in the insect world and also plant biodiversity on Earth. Many insects further need these plants in order to procreate. Removing them causes further insect collapse. Current agriculture practices causes the leaching of nutrients and pollution into the lakes, rivers, and oceans, causing further coral damage and dead zones. These very same practices also leave the soil bare, causing rains to wash away precious topsoil. It takes a thousand years to grow an inch of topsoil, and in the last 2,000 years of human civilization, we've eroded away over 100 feet of topsoil. Stanford University estimates that we may only have 50 years of topsoil remaining. These things are not minor concern. Ice is melting at record levels, causing potential feedback loops. Permafrost is melting, releasing methane. Permafrost melting also causes land sloughs, which causes land to slide like a landslide into the water. Not only are we melting the ice that raises the water levels, but we're also putting the earth into the water as well. Many estimates for global sea level rise are not accounting for this land sloughing into the oceans. It's kind of like the lifeblood of the Western Arctic. Steve Kukel is with the Northwest Territories Geological Survey. He's been up and down the Dempster for a decade. Yeah, the, the Dempster Highway is built uh, pretty much entirely over permafrost terrain. So the frozen ground beneath the road embankment provides a foundation for the embankment. And the actual road itself has a frozen core. But this plateau is warmer and wetter now, and the highway is showing fatigue. So clearly, Steve, the Dempster is falling off here. There's a big hole in the side of the road. And as that ice-rich permafrost thaws, the ground consolidates or settles proportional to how much ice there is in the ground. And uh, this is one of the consequences of that. He's not finished our permafrost lesson. A few kilometers down the road, we clamber up to a high ridge. This whole area here has developed over the last couple of years, That's, which is very, very rapid. And the head wall here has been carved out, exposing a wide band of ice. So the bottom five to eight meters is all ice. So that's what's thawing. That's exactly what's thawing, yeah. Constant thawing is creating a gully of mud, pushing toward the Dempster Highway, which in time could compromise the road. We've had this debris tongue that's grown about 150 meters towards the road. That, that, that's developed in the last two years. Canada's permafrost problem has become a hot research environment. A recent Senate report identified northern infrastructure as an urgent priority. The challenge is luring international scientists and students, like this university team, on a field trip to study the ice under the tundra.
When I was 21 years old, I had all this physics homework. Physics homework requires taking breaks, and Wikipedia was relatively new, so I took a lot of breaks there. I kept going back to the same articles, reading them again and again, on glaciers, Antarctica, and Greenland. How cool would it be to visit these places? And what would it take to do so? Well, here we are on a repurposed Air Force cargo plane operated by NASA, flying over the Greenland ice sheet. There's a lot to see here, but there's more that is hidden, waiting to be uncovered. What the Wikipedia articles didn't tell me is that there's liquid water hidden inside the ice sheet, because we didn't know that yet. I did learn on Wikipedia that the Greenland ice sheet is huge, the size of Mexico, and its ice from top to bottom is two miles thick. But it's not just static; the ice flows like a river downhill towards the ocean. As it flows around bends, it deforms and cracks. I get to study these amazing ice dynamics, which are located in one of the most remote physical environments remaining on Earth. To work in glaciology right now is like getting in on the ground floor at Facebook in the 2000s. <laughs> Our capability to fly airplanes and satellites over the ice sheets is revolutionizing glaciology. It's just starting to do for science what the smartphone has done for social media. The satellites are reporting a wealth of observations that are revealing new, hidden facts about the ice sheets continuously. For instance. We have observations of the size of the Greenland ice sheet every month, going back to 2002. You can look towards the bottom of the screen here to see the month and the year go forward. You can see that some areas of the ice sheet melt or lose ice in the summer. Other areas experience snowfall or gain ice back in the winter. The seasonal cycle, though, is eclipsed by an overall rate of mass loss that would have stunned a glaciologist 50 years ago. We never thought that an ice sheet could lose mass into the ocean this quickly. Since these measurements began in 2002, the ice sheet has lost so much ice that if that water were piled up on our smallest continent, it would drown Australia knee deep. How is this possible? Well, under the ice lies the bedrock. We used radar to image the hills, valleys, mountains, and depressions that the ice flows over. Hidden under the ice sheet are channels the size of the Grand Canyon that funnel ice and water off of Greenland and into the ocean. The reason that radar can reveal the bedrock is that ice is entirely transparent to radar. You can do an experiment: go home and put an ice cube in the microwave. It won't melt because microwaves or radar pass straight through the ice without interacting. If you want to melt your ice cube, you have to get it wet. Because, because water heats up easily in the microwave. That's the whole principle the microwave oven is designed around. Radar can see water, and radar has revealed a vast pool of liquid water hidden under my colleague Olivia, seven stories beneath her feet. Here, she has used a pump to bring some of that water back to the ice sheet surface. Just six years ago, we had no idea this glacier aquifer existed. The aquifer formed when snow melts in the summer sun and trickles downward. It puddles up in huge pools. From there, the snow acts as an igloo, insulating this water from the cold and the wind above. So the water can stay hidden in the ice sheet in liquid form year after year. The question is, what happens next? Does the water stay there forever? It could, or does it find a way out to reach the global ocean? One possible way for the water to reach the bedrock and from there the ocean is a crevasse or a crack in the ice. When cracks fill with water, the weight of the water forces them deeper and deeper. This is how fracking works to extract natural gas from deep within the earth. Pressurized fluids fracture rocks. All it takes is a crack to get started. Well, we recently discovered that there are cracks available in the Greenland ice sheet. Near this glacier aquifer, you can fly over most of the Greenland ice sheet and see nothing—no cracks, no features on the surface. But as this helicopter flies towards the coast, the path that water would take on its quest to flow downhill, one crack appears, then another, 
and another. Are these cracks filled with liquid water? And if so, how deep do they take that water? Can they take it to the bedrock and the ocean? To answer these questions, we need something beyond remote sensing data. We need numeric models. Now that we know the aquifer water is getting to the base of the ice sheet, the next question is: Is it making the ice itself flow faster into the ocean? We're trying to uncover these mysteries hidden inside the Greenland ice sheet, so that we can better plan for the sea level rise it holds. The amount of ice that Greenland has lost since 2002 is just a small fraction of what that ice sheet holds. Ice sheets are immense, powerful machines that operate on long timescales. In the next 80 years, global sea levels will rise at least 20 centimeters, perhaps as much as one meter, and maybe more. Our understanding of future sea level rise is good, but our projections have a wide range. It's our role as glaciologists and scientists to narrow these uncertainties. How much sea level rise is coming, and how fast will it get here? We need to know how much and how fast, so the world and its communities can plan for the sea level rise that's coming. Thank you. Millions of Americans live on a coast, but a new report says sea levels could rise as much as a foot within 30 years. That means coastal cities could flood even on sunny days. Meteorologist Tom Sater joins us. Tom, show us what the world is expected to look like just 30 years from now. Well, Anna, these reports that are coming out in the scientific community are still heralding the same message that climate change is occurring. Hottest seven years. I mean, look at it. The last seven have been the hottest, but we've been warming much more before that. These reports, however, are coming with more severity. This is the month of January. Temperature anomalies. Many are like, "Hey, it's been a cold winter. Look at the blue in North America." That's because all the cold is getting pushed out of the Arctic. The Arctic is warming three times faster than the rest of the planet. Remember last year in Texas, 40% of the U.S. population lives within 60 miles of the coast. 40% of the world lives on coastlines. So here's what we're looking at: an increase in sea level. It's not just the melting of the ice caps in Greenland or in Antarctica. It's the warming of the waters, and that's called. Thermal expansion it creates a higher sea level. So the report here it is. We are warming up. Uh, we'll warm up, or should say, a sea level rise in 30 years, just as we saw in the last 100. An incredible rate. And again, coastal areas 10 to 12 inches. That's if we stay where we are in a planet rising. Notice we're at 1.2 degrees Celsius. We're trying not to get to two. At 1.5 degrees warm up, we're up a foot and a half. But if we continue to do nothing, the report says at three degrees Celsius warm up, we're at 21 feet on the coastlines. So again, the report goes on to say uh, the Jersey coast back in the 50s would have coastal flooding with a high tide maybe once every one to two years. Now it's several times a year. But also since 2000. Two days of flooding in Miami, Charleston, or even New York City, and now it's ten days. The before and after pictures are astonishing. If you look at around,、uh, you know, the Lady Liberty here, Ellis Island, complete inundation. And that's with three degrees. So we're looking at some worst case scenarios because the planet is not doing enough. Governments think it's too expensive. If you think it's too expensive to change our policies to get into renewable energy, try moving. Cities from around not just the eastern coastline of the U.S. but out to the west as well and around the world. So again, as we're noticing this,、uh, the increased rate that we're seeing right now with doing absolutely nothing is mind-boggling. And now scientific projections are saying, "Hey, we're warming up faster than we we thought we would." So these futuristic models are getting a better handle. That's San Francisco.、Uh, you can go down to other areas, even around the world. I mean, there's London. So again,、wow. these policymakers, sure, they can pledge whatever they want, but don't leave it up to individual companies to change this. These images are astonishing. However, one country is Indonesia that has their capital in Jakarta just broke ground on a new capital in Kalimantan. They are sinking as the sea levels rise. So these reports are coming out left and right,、uh, left and right, and it's never good news. Yeah, those befores and potential afters are really striking. Tom Sater, thank you. Much of the damage we've done has caused permanent damage to the carrying capacity of the Earth.
Sea level rise is a good example of this, where although it might take hundreds or even a thousand years, part of the ice melting is locked in at this point. And while we might only see one to five feet of global sea level rise by 2100, we might have up to 40 feet of sea level rise locked in. That is, if humanity disappeared, this will still play out. On average, sea level is currently rising about 1.4 inches per decade. That rate is projected to increase as global temperatures warm. And one of the most important tipping points is the leading edge of the Thwaites Glacier. Thwaites is called the Doomsday Glacier because if this glacier completely retreats, the world's oceans go up by 60 centimeters, at least. But if this system really does collapse, we're more likely going to look at a couple of meters of sea level rise. And that's scary. That's a lot of the eastern seaboard. That's a lot of Florida. But that's a lot of Bangladesh underwater. Researchers estimate that the leading shelf could collapse in less than a decade. That shelf slows the rest of the glacier from flowing into the ocean. And Kaya was one of the first four people to ever stand on it. So we put a robot through the ice and it swam up to a grounding zone and we were just sitting there in the tent going, that's it. Oh my gosh, we're seeing it. Like we are the first humans ever seeing this. There is this huge kind of thermal reservoir of heat that's sitting beneath it. You know, there are something like 25 million people who live within the, the zone that will be inundated by global sea level rise within the next uh, several decades. And the real question is, how long does it take for that to happen? Historically, uh, our, models, uh, our models have actually underestimated the rates at which um, that can happen. And so I could give you a number. I could say the models today say it might take half a century. It might take a century. But if you look at the history of the science, it's taught us that if anything, many of these impacts are likely to proceed faster than our models have predicted. If you looked at where we were, say, a decade or, or ago, we weren't yet seeing major contributions from uh, the collapsing of the ice sheets. But now what we're seeing is that the ice sheets are starting to kick in. That includes the Greenland ice sheet, and there may be enough ice there to contribute five meters of sea level rise. And a large part of the Antarctic ice sheet that could be part of a large scale uh, collapse you know, over the next several decades to contribute maybe another five meters or so uh, of sea level rise. So together we're talking on the order of 10 meters, you know, 30 feet of global sea level rise. 30 feet of sea level rise would be absolutely catastrophic. And it's a long way off, but what matters right now is how Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets respond in the near term, faster or slower than models predict. To understand how feedback loops might work on the ice, back to Kaya Riverman. In the world of studying glaciers, we used to think on a timeline of thousands of years. We used to think that glaciers just kind of slowly respond to their climate. And over time, that number has gotten shorter and shorter. We've learned that oh, actually glaciers respond on a couple years kind of time frame to the changes that happen in the ocean and the atmosphere. And then even more recently, we've seen that, oh wow, in a matter of weeks, glaciers can significantly change. The clearest example of this occurred in 2002, when an unprecedented 3,250 square kilometers of the Larsen B ice shelf collapsed in just over one month. And this kind of melting is what we're seeing right now on Thwaites. Thwaites is a big, thick glacier. It flows out into the ocean and forms an ice shelf. And that's the floating part of the glacier. And that floating part runs into an island. And you can imagine that acts kind of like a dam. The ice shelf itself, when it falls apart, doesn't actually contribute to sea level rise because it's already floating in the ocean. But as it breaks apart. It's no longer this stabilizing force for all the ice behind it. The dam is crumbling away. And so this huge volume of ice on land behind it can speed up and flow into the ocean a lot more rapidly. And so that's why we're focusing so much on this one little corner, because it's stabilizing this system right now. 
So the Thwaites expedition team drilled through the shelf to get an idea of what's happening underneath. One of the biggest surprises for us as part of putting our robot through the ice and measuring what the water column was like was learning just how warm and salty it is underneath this ice. It's a couple degrees above its freezing point. And that wasn't the only surprise for the expedition. We put instruments on the surface of the ice, and what we saw was that inland of the point where the glacier goes afloat, it bends and flexes with the tides in a way that sets up kind of like a pump that can bring seawater inland. All of the water that we're talking about is pretty cold, but to the ice, that's like putting a blowtorch underneath it because that water is able to have so much melting impact just by being a couple of degrees above freezing. You know, in the next three, four, five, six years, we're going to see this ice shelf changing really rapidly and disintegrating. You know, dangerous climate change has arrived, so the question is how bad are we willing to let it get? And there is fairly widespread recognition that if we can keep the warming of the planet below about one and a half degrees Celsius, that's about three degrees Fahrenheit, there's still time to prevent the worst changes from happening. And that requires a pretty dramatic reduction in carbon emissions. So we can't just talk about these far off targets that sort of kick the can down the road several decades. We've got to talk about those near term targets that require action immediately. There is a huge difference in what happens if we act dramatically now or if we fail to act. Even though we think of this place as being far away and at the bottom of the world, we impact it and it impacts us. And so it's not really that far away. As we've seen, sea level rise is happening and it's happening much faster than we previously believed. Those most affected by sea level rise will be the poorest communities around the world. At what point do we tell the 1% who's destroying our planet that we won't stand for it anymore, that we demand overhaul? We have to ask ourselves, what if collapse isn't immediate? What if collapse happens as a slow degradation of the entire natural world? We have to choose what kind of world we want to live for our children. And every day that we don't choose, we actually do choose. We make the choice to leave a degraded world for our kids. The analogy that I like to use to compare um, conventional and unconventional oil and gas is to say that conventional oil and gas are a bit like saying, well, you're thirsty, you want to have another drink, so you go up to the bar and you get a beer and you sit there and you drink it in comfort. Unconventional oil and gas is what you do when the bar is closed and you can't get another beer, but you're still really desperate. So you decide that sucking spear, spilled beer out of the carpet is a good idea. So you're going to get a mouthful of dirt. It's going to be a huge amount of energy in for very little return. It's going to be a thoroughly unsatisfactory experience and in no way a substitute for what you can no longer have. But that's, that's essentially what we're doing when we look at moving to this unconventional oil and gas. This is not the end of peak oil. This is just the desperation phase of, of a society of energy addicts attempting to suck spilled beer out of the carpet. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a dinosaur. When I got a little bit older, I wanted to be an astronaut. As I hit my 20s, I started to feel disconnected. I felt like I was born too late to see the moon landing. I was born too early to see human colonization of space. But as I've gotten older and learned a little bit more about the challenges that humanity faces, gotten into permaculture and activism and sustainability, I've come to the realization that the humans that are alive today, my generation, the generation younger than me, generation older than me, are probably going to go down in history as the most important humans who've ever existed, ever. It's our generations and our collective ideas of where society has to go, what problems we solve and where we spend our money that are going to determine the course of human history. When you understand overshoot and you understand carrying capacity and how existing inside of overshoot causes a reduction in carrying capacity, that, that could be a number of things. It could be extinctions, it could be water pollution, it could be the general health of society. 
you start to realize that eroding away our carrying capacity is the surest path to extinction. As that carrying capacity erodes away, even if we stay stable, even if we're sustainable, we actually enter into precipitous freefall. We exist right now in Overshoot, in a largely unjust world where many people live below what most of us would consider the poverty line. And through our best intentions, we want to bring everyone's lifestyle up to what we in North America and Europe experience. Even the green movement talks about climate equity. And these are good things and they're important things. I would say mandatory things. But the same people who are chiming for climate equity are ignoring the fact that they have to change their lives. <laughs> right now we need 1.7 Earths to sustain what we are consuming. And if everyone lives the way that Americans do, we need between four and five Earths. The fundamental truth is that if we want equality, the lifestyles that many of us experience must be reduced. Not just a minor reduction, a massive one. The challenge is how are we going to do that when many people are struggling just to put food on the table? These are the questions that humanity must answer. This is why it hasn't been answered in 50 years and why it might not for 50 more. But if we don't, we're done. Many of the problems we see are sealed in. We can't get extinct species back and they're going extinct every single day. 500 to 1,000 times above base load rate. We can plant trees, but it's very hard to restore an ecosystem. It's very hard to replace thousands of years of an old growth forest with pines and lines in the tree planting. We can pat ourselves on the back and say that we're sequestering carbon because we planted a bunch of pines, but it's not the same. We need to stop actively subsidizing the things that are destroying our planet. Coal, oil and gas, and also unsustainable agriculture. We need to start subsidizing and providing funding for the things that are going to benefit us and save us. We can regrow our soils with silvopasture. It takes a thousand years to grow an inch of soil, but silvopasture can do an inch per year. So while many people in the climate circles are villainizing the cow, the cow is actually a keystone lynch species for restoring our soils. We need to decentralize the food chain and get more people growing food. We need to get food growing on all of our land that we occupy. We need to restore some of our land back to nature. 50 years ago, we could have focused on preservation, but now it's not enough. We could have focused on reducing carbon emissions. Now it's not enough. Planting trees, now it's not enough. We're in a crisis mode where we need everything. None of these things are mutually exclusive. We need to do all the things that we can possibly do to turn this around. And it's not just carbon. We can sequester all the carbon that we want and we won't restore ecosystems. We won't get back extinct species and we won't restore natural resources. We certainly won't fix inequality. So how can we help? What's the solution? I have a video on seven things that you can do to help with the existential crisis that we find ourselves in. These are personal things that you can do in your everyday life that help. We need everybody on board doing these things. But even more than that, we need systemic change. We need political change. We need political and societal will. So the best thing you can do is to share this with as many people as you know. Share this message that we need action now. That it's almost too late and it might already be too late, but we better go down fighting. In the description of this video, I'll leave some links to groups that you can join. Groups that will make a difference to help turn this around. We need political action. We need policy. We need civil unrest. We need disobedience. We need to change this because words and promises, they haven't worked in the past and they won't work anymore. We need to all realize that we might be the most important humans that have ever existed. And this is the most important time that's ever existed. So what are you going to do, you watching this right now? I'm dedicating my life to raising awareness for the problems that we're facing. What are you going to do? Oh, hi there. If you enjoyed this video at all, I put in hundreds of hours worth of editing and research into making this video, and it's over an hour of entertainment and footage and education. If you're at all interested in supporting this, if you like this content and you want to see more, consider joining our Patreon and supporting us directly. Or second best thing is join the YouTube membership program with a little button down below. Thanks for watching. See you guys on the next one.